Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 15th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, HB 2001, the House Finance Committee's hot off the presses troubling proposal to go down the same fiscal road yet again. Second, our concerns with rumors of a PFD compromise. It can't just involve the PFD. And third, by delaying the inevitable, the university's board of regents are making the situation worse. And now, let's join Michael. Number one, Brad, has got to be, of course, the latest um, just shenanigans by the legislature in taking SB or HB 2001 and stuffing a substitute right into the middle of it, which just completely changes the whole, I guess, game at this point. Uh, let's delve right. down into it. What say you? Well, uh, we're going to be at this a long time, if, if, if that's the approach. The governor was trying to get the PFD resolved, get that off the table, and then go on to the capital budget and get that resolved by the end of July, which is a deadline that's important because potential, potentially we lose a billion dollars in federal funding if we don't have the matching funds, state matching funds passed by the end of July. And then, um, and then once those two things were off the table, sort of readdress the remainder of the capital budget um, and, and potentially some addbacks from the, uh, from the vetoes. But the legislature, uh, from their standpoint, don't – it doesn't want to do it that way. Uh, doesn't want to do it the way the governor called it, and so they're trying to put everything back on the table uh, and have uh, have a giant bill that that I think uh, potentially threatens getting the capital budget, the the, the matching funds done by the end of July, um, and certainly threatens the potential of, or certainly creates the potential that we won't have a a PFD uh, by the time we come to uh, October one. The real deadline for that's September one, so that. So the permanent fund division can can get all of the ducks in the row to send out the check. So um, potentially we we won't have a, a PFD set up by August one, for, by September one. So it's um, we're 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 in a very long game, and and I don't think anybody's clear where this comes out. I uh, you know I'm looking at this and I and I I'm looking at how they. Uh have decided to do this. And, and I just think at this point, even with their own legal counsel advising them that what they're doing may be outside the call, they are just damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. Uh, this is, this is the way it is. I mean, do they feel like they've got the backing of the people? What, I mean, th this is, this has become very apparent that this group of folks have now decided to prioritize government spending at the expense of, of the lowest income earners in the state of Alaska, the lowest 50 percent will be harmed the most by this. And uh, and I just wonder, you know, what what are they thinking? I mean, at this point. Well, the, 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 the best interpretation of this is they're trying to set up uh, negotiations, overall negotiations for for an overall resolution that would include restored funding. Uh, and include um, uh, a PFD of a, a reduced PFD of some sort. That seems to be what they're setting up. But but they're doing it. They're doing it in a way that, frankly, if they pass this bill and the Senate passes the bill, it gets vetoed again. And as Lyman Hoffman put it, 
about a week and a half ago, we just go right back to the starting point. We start all over, and by then we're we're, we're in late July, if not if not the end of July. Um, and so we're, they're really, I mean, they're 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 trying to keep negotiations open in a way. They're trying to open negotiation negotiations in a way that I think just strings that just strings us out. You mentioned the the PFD. They did use a, a remainder of a leftover PFD approach, which is you spend all of the all of the POMV draw. You spend all of the permanent fund earnings that the legislature has said said they're going to take out. You spend all you can for government first, and then you ha- you use the leftover for the PFD. Um, and that, frankly, is just as we've talked on the show again and again and again, is just a way of imposing a tax on middle and lower income Alaska families to pay for government, letting the top 20 percent off the hook with a trivial amount and, and not charging not charging non-residents who pull Alaska paychecks at all, not charging them anything. So they're using a highly regressive tax approach. If if they were going to, they were really going to try to advance the ball uh, in the in the talks. G- given the breadth of what they think they can do uh, in in this bill, uh, they one would have hoped they would have tried to use a a more neutral tax approach, a more neutral revenue revenue raising approach. Try to you know at least surface that in the context of this bill and get that on the table from the legislature standpoint. After all, all of these, virtually all of the, of the House majority says they're concerned about uh, middle, the impact on middle and lower income Alaska families of these budget cuts. But yet they're using a tax approach, they're using a revenue approach that directly hits middle and lower income uh, Alaska families. So if they were truly serious about that and they truly wanted to, van- to advance the ball uh, with respect to getting some some more even, some more neutral uh, revenue ra- raising approach for their spending, uh, one would have hoped they would have used a flat tax approach or some other tax approach to raise revenue in a way that was a that was a more neutral neutral impact. I think they're showing their cards that they've truly become the top 20% caucus, a caucus that looks out for the top 20% first. Um, and really doesn't care that much about middle and lower income Alaska families when you get right down to it. I think they've truly shown their cards by using the the leftover approach, the leftover dividend approach that is that is the worst tax outcome for for middle and lower income Alaska families. What they're really saying in this in this proposed budget, and and they they themselves are, are claiming they could have put anything in that budget to, to justify the PFD. What they themselves are saying is, is we're looking out for the top 20% because we're not going to tax them. We're going to tax middle and lower income Alaska families. We're looking out for the top 20%, and we're looking out for those constituencies that are dependent on government spending. Um, and and it's really a combination of those two is 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 what they've what they put out put out in this budget. So I think it's a it's a it's a big step backwards. Not only are they delaying. Getting this issue, getting these issues resolved by not following the governor's order in which to take these up. Not only are they putting at risk having a capital budget uh, that's necessary, having the portion of the capital budget that's necessary to to get federal matching funds. Not only are they putting at risk any PFD, they're doing it in a way that that clearly indicates they don't have any regard for middle and lower income Alaska families because they're taxing them the most. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget, <clears throat> and uh, we're doing the weekly top three. We're in number one, talking about HB 2001, which again would give us a remainder dividend and stuff all $444 million back into the uh, into the budget. Brad, as a guy who likes numbers and you look at the fiscal uh, you know, effects and, and impacts of this and you look at the, the details and, and where what all has happened here, uh, I mean, what say you when when you look at this number? I mean, if you look at the fact that last year we raised the budget, you know, during a recession in the fourth year when private businesses were shuttering, uh, employees were getting laid off, but the government decided to increase spending by about half a billion dollars, um, and and now we've taken these cuts. And when you take that increase into effect, this is really from the historicals of the previous five years. This is really only a cut of about six and a half percent. 
um, you know, again, disallowing this last little bump, this little speed bump of, of increase. Even if you leave the speed bump in, you're only talking about a 10 or 12 percent increase. People were acting like they were cutting government and gutting it with a fishing knife that it was going down to. We're slashing it by 50, 60 percent. People will be dying in the streets. And it was just, you know, but as a, as a numbers guy, how do you look at this? Well, what we've done is we've built up a state that's dependent. Uh, uh, segments of it are highly dependent on government spending. And these cuts will <clears throat> will seriously affect uh, some of those segments of government. A, a big one is the university, just to take the university as an example. Yes, it's a, it's a significant cut to the university, and the university is going to have to do things differently than they have before. Some people see that as the, as the end of the world. But, but the problem is we've built up too big a university. We built up a university. I mean, we've talked on the show about this a lot. We've built up a university that has three separate institutions. The Constitution only contemplates one, spans roughly 250 percent, between 200 and 250 percent of the national average uh, in terms of in terms of per student um, uh, state funding um, and and has all sorts of programs, duplications between various campuses. That's too big a university uh, for the state in its in its current fiscal situation to be able to afford, so what we're really doing is we're coming back to what we can't afford. It looks big, if you assume it looks like big cuts, dramatic cuts, end of earth cuts to some. If you assume that what we had built up was the right level, the problem is it wasn't the right level. So so we're coming back to a level that we can afford. We're coming back to a to per student uh, uh, spending, for example, of between 130 and 150 percent. It's lower than 250 percent, yes, but it's still higher than the national average. It's about the national average plus an Alaska adjustment. So it's um, – we're, we're, it, it depends on where you come, come at it. If you come at it that, oh, my gosh, we build up all this infrastructure and all, this, all these people dependent on federal – dependent on state spending, we've got to continue to support them. Some of them are going to lose jobs. Um, yeah, it's big. It's big from that standpoint. But if you come at it and look at it from what can Alaska afford, what what is the right size of our state government relative to the revenue levels that we have now? These cuts are just getting us back in line with where we should have, where we should be, uh, and where we need to be in order to have a a sustainable, long term revenue-supportable uh, uh, state government. Brad Keithley is our guest. Uh, Brad, uh, number one here, we're getting ready to wrap it up, HB 2001. $444 million in spending goes back into the budget, basically eliminating all of the governor's vetoes. It leaves us with a $1,000 dividend, $929. What should the governor do, in your opinion, or what should we do, in your opinion, both? How about that? Well, if I were the governor, I, I, if I were the governor, I would say, look, I've already vetoed this amount. Do whatever you're doing here. Um, and get it through. I'm going to veto it again. If you want to get serious about about addressing what I put on the call, the PFD uh, and and the capital budget that we need to pass by the portion of the capital budget that we piece, need to pass by the end of July, let's do that. Uh, and if I were the governor, I would say, let's get that done. Let's do these in sequence. Um, if, if all you're, and it, but if I were the governor and I, and I would say, if all you're going to do is mess around with this bill, go ahead and do it. You're putting Alaskans at risk. You're putting the, the, the capital budget at risk. Go ahead and do it. Pass it quickly. I'm going to veto it. Uh, and we'll be right back where we started. Uh, you're not progressing the ball by, by trying to, to reinvent the wheel or redo what we've just been through. Uh, we need to go through these things in sequence and, and address them. It, the, the, one in particular, I would say, if I were the governor, I'm serious about the university cuts. We, we're, I'm not playing games about those. This is where I think the university needs to be. You guys are wasting time if you think you're going to pass a higher budget, send it to me, and all of a sudden I'm going to you know, agree to a higher spending level. I'm serious about these cuts. We're going to make them. Let's focus on the things where we potentially can agree the, the, the portion of the capital budget 
related to the to the federal uh, 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 matching funds uh, and the PFD, and then let's go on and talk about the remainder of the capital budget, which may include some of these other things. You know, Brad, what concerns me most about all these things is the absolute lawlessness that we're seeing, not just in Alaska, but across the country. Uh, people on the left and the right, uh, primarily right now it seems like on the left uh, more often than not, just completely ignoring the law, abrogating it, being hailed as heroes. Somebody was talking about the person that attacked the ICE detention center uh, in Tacoma now being lauded by some as a hero for trying to free these poor, miserable bastards who've snuck into the country and uh, and everything else. And it just seems like, you know, we're, we're reaching that point to where the rule of law seems to mean nothing. And that is the cornerstone of Western Foundation. And it's really starting to bother me. Well, it is. And and this most recent batch in Alaska uh, sort of started with the Supreme Court's decision that the legislature could ignore the law uh, with respect to uh, the permanent fund dividend. There are those who take it back further, the legislature ignoring the statute on the 90-day session and, and so on. But, but this most recent batch on, on the fiscal side started with the Supreme Court's decision that you could ignore the statute. You and I have talked about on the show before, you've talked about your experience on the Fairbank City Council. Yes, one legislature can't bind another, but but the remedy for that is for the is for a legislature to go through and pass changes if in the law. If they don't like the old law, if they don't like the existing law, there there is a remedy for that, and that is get a majority um, and and pass a and pass a change in the law. Um, get the governor to sign it, um, and if not, override it. So the le- the, there's, a, there's a provision where the legislature can go forward even without the governor's uh, signature, even with a, with a governor's veto. Uh, but that's the way to change the law. The, the, the Supreme Court's approval of just ignoring the law uh, on the PFD, I think, started us down a very bad road. And, and we've seen it now come out in this legislature uh, uh, in terms of ignoring the, PF, the, ignoring the PFD again, saying that SB 26, uh, which is the, 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 the law that limits the draw from the, uh, from the permanent fund earnings account, the POMB law, is somehow sacrosanct, uh, but the, but the, um, uh, the uh, uh, permanent fund dividend statute is not. And we've seen it from the, from the administration side, too. They've ignored the senior benefits uh, statute and some of the other uh, statutes on the books uh, in some of some of these vetoes, and now the legislature's just taken it to a new level uh, with this with this division between Juno and Wasilla. Uh, the legislature um, said, "Well, yeah, we know that there's a way that we could call ourselves uh, into session and we could control the agenda, but we can't get enough votes for it. But we're just going to ignore that anyway, <laughs> and go ahead and call our and, and say that we're calling ourselves." In a session in, in in Juno, it's just it's it's one progression after another of taking statutes that, that are not guides, they're not suggestions, they're statutes, taking statutes and and ignoring them and just pressing ahead. It, it's 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 disturbing, frankly, from a fiscal standpoint, because you you have no idea what the rules are now. You have no idea going into any given legislature. You know whether they're going to observe this rule, th- these statutes, or those statutes, or ignore those statutes, and 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 you know make up some other rules that they want to that they want to play by. Not, not even Congress does this. At least Congress goes through the the motions of of suspending laws, passing bills that suspend laws, getting the president's signature when they want to when they start to want to go off on a different fiscal track. No one's doing. No one that I'm I'm familiar with is doing what this legislature is doing, which is just basically ignoring them, ignoring the laws as they go along. Which, again, is very troubling. I mean, I think that this decision by the courts need to, needs to be uh, reviewed and challenged, quite honestly, because, as I've said before, the, the way the law reads, no legislature can bind another legislature up. That's and that's understandable because sometimes circumstances t- change, laws need to be changed. But that doesn't mean that they just ignore the law in the book. They have to follow the process, which is, you know, have the have the hearing, get the majority vote, change the law in that way. And then they can you know, that's how they circumvent the law is by changing it. Uh, I mean, that's part of that whole process. Uh, but by just simply, no, I don't feel like doing that. 
Uh, I mean, it is it's setting us up quite honestly for. I mean, I hate to to be you know hyperbolic and say it's anarchy, but really that's kind of what it sets us up for when they can just decide to pick and choose which law, leave the law on the books, but then decide to just ignore it. That's just a recipe for disaster. It is. It is. And and you know, so they've they've been very careful about passing SB twenty six, which which limits the, the, the POM which limits the draw from the earnings reserve, which I think is is frankly an important law because it it, it, it creates a, a good division between what current Alaskans can take out and what they need to leave in the in the permanent fund for future Alaskans to have an investment base for future Alaskans. But but you know, next session they they might ignore that. You got through number one now we need to hit on number two and number three if we could squeeze them both in. Number two is very troubling to me. We're hearing rumors of a compromise. Now I've been hearing this since last week, but uh, I hadn't put a lot of uh, hadn't put a lot of faith in it. But more and more, I'm starting to hear this now. Jeff Landfield over at the Alaska Landmine has made a mention of it. Brad, uh, what uh, what what are you hearing? Well, I've been hearing some chatter also. This is the first time I've seen it show up in the press. Or, or what we call press in Alaska, it's it's in Landfield's Sunday uh, Sunday uh, uh, column, and it says the the quote is there's been some chatter that Dunleavy is quietly pushing a proposal for a twenty two hundred dollar PFD that would be in statute along with the constitutional amendment that says the statute can't be changed without a vote of the people. Word is he is getting a lot of flack from the business community to resolve all the chaos. The twenty two hundred dollar PFD roughly correlates with the PFD that would result from taking a uh, taking a 50-50 approach to the to the percent of market value draw from uh, from the from the earnings reserve right now the the PFD statute and the POMB statute operate in a different way the POMB statute sets the draw uh, that you can make from the earnings reserve the PFD sat- statute calculates PFD based on a concept known as statutory net income. And by the time you adjust for uh, 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 inflation proofing, uh, what's really going on uh, in terms of the PFD is using the current PFD statute results in about 75% of the, between government and and the permanent fund, about permanent fund dividend, about 75% of the POMB draw goes toward the permanent fund dividend um, and about 25% uh, ends up going to government. That's the way the two statutes uh, shake out. They're compatible in the sense that there's enough in the earnings reserve draw coming from the POMV, coming from SB 26, to pay the dividend. So there's not a conflict between between the two statutes. But the operation of the two statutes together result in the permanent fund dividend taking about 75% of that draw and the and the and government only getting about 25 percent of that draw what what the what some have suggested including me um uh on occasion is a better approach and probably in i would argue and i've written a column on this uh an approach more consistent with governor hammond's original vision is to have is to is to is to reset the pfd at 50 percent of the pomb draw and have that POMB draw be 50% to government and 50% to the PFD. And, and that's the number, the, the, the $2,200 that's mentioned in, in Landfield's column, is the number you would get from doing that. There's a problem, however, uh, a big problem, with doing that, that compromise without resolving the rest of, of our fiscal situation, without resolving how you pay for the rest of government. It, even if you redo the PFD, to 50/50 of the of the percent of market value, you you still have and 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 use the other 50% now for government. You still have a big deficit uh, in in state spending. You have a deficit in state spending even under uh, Governor Dunleavy's original uh, original budget. So so you've got it. You've got to deal with. You you can't just deal with the PFD in isolation. You've got to deal with the overall deficit. Um, and 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 do something else for the or have a revenue measure that covers the remainder of the deficit. If you don't do that, all you're doing is this. All you're doing is cutting the PFD from its current statutory level down to the down to the 50% of POM POMV level, and you're just setting up a situation 
where those who want to use the PF, a PFD to pay for government, they just have a lower base to start from next year. Instead of trying to cut the PFD from $3,000 down to $900, uh, Senator Von Imhoff and Chris Birch and others who, you, who, who argue for the leftover approach will just come in and say, well, we're only going to cut the PFD down from $2,200 down to $900. That, that, it won't stop the debate about the, the co- a compromise on the PFD, won't stop the debate on the PFD, um, uh, if you don't solve the remainder of the of the revenue equation, uh, you've got it. You've got to solve it all at once. Solving just a, the PFD portion of it uh, just it just resets the base. Now some will say, yeah, but we're gonna we're gonna couple uh, this 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 redo of the PFD with a constitutional amendment. We're gonna get the PFD in the Constitution and we're gonna take it off the table. There's nothing guaranteed about getting that constitutional amendment passed. And in agreeing to compromise the PFD in advance of a const- in advance of getting the constitutional amendment passed, and in advance of resolving the re- remainder of government spending, how we're going to fund the remainder of government spending, you'll leave the PFD sort of sitting out there as a sitting duck. Uh, this this reduced base is a sitting duck uh, for at least the year until you get to the constitutional amendment, and maybe longer if the constitutional amendment doesn't pass. So it's. It, you've got to me. You've got to resolve all of the fiscal issues, uh, and the PFD probably is part of that. Probably moving from 50% of statutory net earnings down to 50% of of the of the POMV draw is probably part of that overall resolution. But you can't do that part alone and think that you're think that you're preserving the PFD because people are just going to come back and start from that lower base. You've got to resolve the entire revenue situation at once with the with the PFD being part of that resolution. If we made Brad Keithley uh, from Alaskans for a Sustainable Budgets king for a day, how would you fix this specific part of the situation? What would you what would you suggest if you could wave your magic wand and make it so? Well, I would say that I would what I would do is say that we're going to we're going to raise revenue uh, uh, additional revenue through a flat tax that we're going to have a flat tax uh, that sits out there uh, to, to to pay for any uh, funding that we have or any spending that we have over over traditional revenues. I would include uh, a resolution of the PFD by moving it to what I think is a better better fulfillment of Governor Hammond's vision of going to 50/50 of the of POMV, I would change the POMV draw rate. I think the POMV draw rate is too low now. I think it needs to be moved up a little bit to reflect what actual realized real earnings have been uh, over time, uh, and that would give us a little bit more revenue both for the PFD and for the um, and for uh, government. The resolution of that, I think, would be we still need to have significant cuts. Uh, Governor Dunleavy's cuts set the right direction on those cuts. But we need it. But, 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 but even under Gun, Governor Dunleavy's budgets, we need additional revenues. We would create additional revenues by uh, by creating a flat tax that would treat all Alaskans and non-residents uh, the same. Take the same percentage uh, of have the same percentage tax apply to all of them, uh, and we would reform the PFD uh, that would raise a little bit of revenue on the uh, on the government side and on the and on and, and after doing the 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 draw rate, the POMV draw rate, raise a little bit of revenue again uh, on the uh, on the PFD side. I, I think that's a resolution, and at the end of it, we have revenues that match spending. We have a flat tax that that sits as an incentive. I mean, if if, if you want to if you want to increase spending, then then what you're going to have to do is increase the flat tax from say three to four percent. People are going to push back from that. People from all income classes are going to push back on that, and we're going to find a balance between. Uh, what we want, which is spending, and what we're willing to pay, which is revenues, a balance that involves all Alaskans having all Alaskans having skin in the game. Would you uh, would you revisit the oil tax structure? Because we're seeing more and more that people are starting to take a look at that and say, that, you know, that that doesn't make sense. I mean, I know Will akowski has been beating that drum for a long time, but now Stedman and others are starting to say it as well, as well as some Republicans. I think I think the oil, oil tax structure always needs to be revisited. The question is, are do we have our taxes set at a level that that continues to attract investment that keeps us competitive 
in the investment market for additional investment. Additional investment is important because that drives uh, future development, drives future production, and drives future revenues. So it's important for future Alaskans and future revenue that we continue to have healthy investment in the oil sector. The, the, the way to do that is to ensure that our tax structure uh, takes all that we can up to the point where we start adversely affecting investment. The oil industry, the, the global oil industry is a dynamic structure. There's always changes in, in where you're producing from, what the marginal source of production is, uh, what the cost structure is, and, and there's, always, there's always evolution in that. So I think, it, I think it's incumbent on the legislature, frankly, to have a continuous review going on of oil taxes. Uh, SB 21 set up a set up a board that frankly has not been utilized that much, but set up a board called the Oil and Gas Competitive, Competitiveness Review Board, and the purpose of that board was to have sort of this ongoing review of tax structure to make sure that we were always getting uh, all that we can up to the point where we negatively affected investment. It's a long way of saying yes. I think we ought to be examining oil taxes with the with the goal being to ensure that we have a tax structure that is all we can get short of pushing investment away or, or negatively <laughs> aff- affecting investment. Brad, uh, yeah, I mean, this is part of the problem is that, you know, we're, we've, we've, we've got a lot of numbers flying around here, and there's been a lot of uh, concern. Uh, people who've been listening to the show for a long time know you and I have been at odds over this oil taxation issue many times, uh, that I was a, a, an opponent of SB 21, you were a proponent, and now some people are saying that this is part of the problem. Um, but putting that aside for just a second, let me just let me just echo what uh, um, what uh, somebody else just actually said in the chat room. Let me scroll back to see who it was. I think it was. Uh, um, now I can't see who it was. But essentially, the 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 impetus was, I'm I don't want to pay until they get their spending in order. But is that a cart and a horse thing? where they're not going to get their spending in order until people are actually outraged because they have to pay? Yeah, I think I think it is, Michael. I've, over the last seven years, I've come to the conclusion, or eight years, I've come to the conclusion that we're not going to get spending in order as long as we have what are, what are free riders out there uh, who, who are voting for spending increases but don't have to pay for them because of the way they're trying to, in this case, use PFD cuts. Right now, we, with, with PFD cuts, what we're doing is we're pushing the burden of government spending off on middle and lower income Alaska families who are pushing back, but we're not, we're not hitting the top 20% of Alaska families who really aren't going to feel any major impact, any significant impact uh, out of PFD cuts. It's like less than 2% uh, of their income will be impacted by, by PFD cuts. So it's sort of a free shot for them or a free rider uh, situation for them. They can push for government spending. I mean, Senator von, von Imhoff gave an impassioned plea last week to, you know, make sure we, we keep government spending pushed back on these vetoes, but she doesn't have to pay for it. Um, so it's a free shot for her, and it's a free shot for others in the top 20%. The only way we're going to get spending under control um, is is not artificially by spending caps or by, by oh, you know, vetoes that, that and, 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 and and paying for paying for the remaining government off the backs of just a portion of Alaskans, the only way we're going to get spending back under control is to get all Alaskans having skin in the game and feeling the impact uh, personally at the same level, uh, feeling the impact personally if we if we if we increase spending or if we don't decrease spending. If people are having to pay all across the board, uh, including non-residents. If people are having to pay three percent of their income for state uh, for state state government, uh, then there's going to be pushback uh, if you try to increase it to three and a half percent because, say, we want to refund the university, or or there's going to be pushback. People who will say we need to lower it to two and a half percent, and 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 across the board pushback to get it down uh, to two and a half percent. Only if we've got everybody with skin in the game. Uh, that's the only way we're going to get spending under control. As long as we leave free riders out there, and right now we've left the top 20% as the free riders, sort of the the worst segment you can leave out there is free riders because some of them benefit from big government. Um, uh, others of them want to, you know, act like they're like they're, you know, community 
minded and, and push for continued big government. Uh, as long as we leave some segment out there without skin in the game, uh, they're going to be pushing for bigger government because it doesn't come off their backs. Um, and we're going to face this sort of situation that we've got in the state right now. Getting everybody with skin in the game, I think, is critically important. Brett, said, uh, Brett in the chat room says, and that 20% consists of whom well according to the analysis that we've done and that brad has done uh it's something like 90 percent of the legislatures are in the top 20 percent income earners in fact a good chunk of them are in like the top five percent income earners in the state of alaska i mean these are people who are making you know big into the six figures and so they don't feel the little dividend nudge but uh, if they if it was a three or four percent tax they would definitely feel that yeah i I mean, and, and, and the people in the top in, in that income bracket are in critical positions. I mean, Senator M. Von Emhoff, who's in the top 1% in Alaska, is, is co-chair of Senate Finance, um, doesn't feel the impact of PFD cuts, and continues to push for spending. Over on the House side, with the change out of Jennifer Johnston for uh, Tammy Wilson, Jennifer Johnston represents the most wealthy district in the state. Uh, has an average income of something in, na- in the neighborhood of 115 to 120 thousand uh, dollars uh, uh, per household. Uh, the most wealthy uh, district in the state. She's pushing uh, for uh, for funding gov- for for maintaining government spending. I mean, this is HB 2001 for maintaining government spending and doing it on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families through through PFD cuts. So not only not only do we have a large segment of the legislature that's in the top 20 percent? The the leadership, I mean, the the, the co-chairs of, of Senate Finance and House Finance, and Kathy Giesel represents the same district, part of the or, – or the same area as Jennifer Johnson. Uh, the leadership is coming from that top 20 percent, top, top 10 percent, top 5 percent. So it, you've got you've to gotta get them in the game. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that if Senator Von Imhoff – had to pay the same uh, tax rate as as she's pushing down on middle and lower income Alaska families. If she had to pay that same tax ta- tax rate, she'd be looking at spending in a lot different way uh, <laughs> than she is. Well, sure, because it's like thirty three percent, thirty four percent on the lowest uh, income Alaskans. If she had to pay that amount, we're talking about three hundred, four hundred thousand bucks a year. She would she would rein that spending in post haste uh i think would be the answer to that um yeah it's like it's like the when the doctors confronted uh the governor and said oh my god you're cutting medicaid you're, you're cutting you know fundamental services um uh and 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 you've got to cut the pfd in order to save those well none of the doctors in the room were were in the middle and lower income bracket they were all in the top 20 percent bracket right. so they want to continue government spending that supported their practices but they didn't want to pay for it because sure. they wanted to you know push the cost off sure. the BFD cuts yeah break off a little money on your own tide if that's what you want to do number three is the elephant in the room it is the university of alaska and uh the questions of whether or not they are actually going to get their spending and their revenue situation squared away Brad joins us now for the third of our weekly top three to talk about the university. Brad, um, where where are we at now? Michael, there were two important uh, developments yesterday, uh, I think, on the on the fiscal front. One was uh, the introduction of HB 2001 uh, before House finance uh, uh, late yesterday afternoon, last evening. Um, And I think that, as we talked about in the first segment, I think that sends us down a, a very bad road, starts us to, starts uh, lengthening out this process. The second uh, was the uh, meeting of the Board of Regents of the university uh, that had been called by the president uh, in response to the governor's veto. Uh, and the purpose of that, of that meeting was really, was really a single purpose. It was to declare fin- uh, financial exigency at the – uh, at the university level, um, which would permit the university to start a process of rapidly reducing its costs. It opens, it, it, it creates the opportunity for the university to uh, reduce faculty that have tenure, uh, faculty that otherwise can't be, uh, can't be uh, uh, cut. Uh, it would give them the opportunity to do that and make some other uh, significant fiscal changes uh, or significant changes in their, in their structure 
uh, that would that would give them the ability to uh, to bring spending down. Uh, to me, hugely disappointing. Uh, the Board of Regents yesterday voted 10 to 1 against uh, declaring uh, financial exigency, and uh, uh, and for sort of maintaining the status quo for another 15 days, another two weeks before they have another meeting um, at the end of July. The problem with that. Uh, the de declaration of ex ex exigency would not have had any impact immediately yesterday. It would have started clocks uh, that the university would have been working against uh, in order to get get spending down. For example, they couldn't lay off tenured professors for 60 days. So it would have started the 60-day clock uh, to start get spending down uh, and and enable them to to be in a position sometime this fall uh, to make to take the steps necessary to. Uh, to reduce spending by by not starting the clock yesterday by 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 voting to put that decision off for two weeks they just delayed that 60-day window uh, that 60-day start time another another two weeks um, and and the universe and so they've continued the current university burn rate the rate at which they're spending for another two weeks instead of instead of starting to instead of starting to ramp down uh, those costs uh, as you know, permitting themselves to ramp down the costs as, as rapidly as they can. That vote was, was to me, a denial of reality. The reality is the university is going to be cut. The university is going to be cut deeply. As we've talked about on this show, if we can't uh, before, if we can't cut the university, we can't cut anything in this state. We're going to end up with a budget that's that is the four point or the the, the four point four billion uh, that uh, that the legislature passed. That's we're, we're, we've sort of bottomed out at that sort of level of spending, and we're going to have to raise revenues uh, to be able to afford that level of spending going forward. If we can't <clears throat> if we can't cut the university, the university is the greatest place, the best place, best example of where you can where you can cut spending. And for the and, and for and so if we were the, the governor's committed to making these cuts, we have enough in the legislature <coughs> excuse me, we have enough in the legislature to uphold those cuts. Um, uh, we've demonstrated that uh, in the past week. We are making these cuts at the university. Um, and for the university to sort of say, oh, let's let's wait another two weeks before we really get serious about this is just a, is just denying reality. So not only not only do we do have a not only do we have a legislature that's going backwards in HB 2001, sort of saying, yeah, we know you made all these cuts, we know you had enough budget to uphold it, but but let's do this again, let's go down this road again, waste time going down this road again. Not only do we have a legislature that's sort of spinning their wheels instead of addressing the 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 the, the, the changes necessary to remake this state into one that's affordable. Now we've got a board of regents that's off doing the same thing and sort of saying that. That uh, uh, that we need to we need to wait it out. Most disappointing was we had we had some of the regions that Governor Dunleavy op appointed, who were who were part of the ten that voted against the declaration of exigency that, that are saying, oh no, we can we can wait. One of those regions, one of the regions that Governor Dunleavy appointed, said, well, let's go back and ask the governor governor for a three year transition, for for enough funding to do to do a three year transition down to this new level. No, folks, you've had you've had at least eight years um, of, of warning that this was coming. In 2011, uh, the, Pat Gamble, who was the incoming president of the university, commissioned a study by a number of outside experts, chaired by a guy by the name of James Fisher, uh, that produced what's called the Fisher Report, that said ex that predicted exactly the situation we're in: that state funding goes down and and the university. Uh, gets cut as part of that state funding. And, and eight years ago, the Fisher Report said you need to be preparing for that day in a number of ways. You need to be get your you need to get your private funding up. You need to be cutting that back down to core programs. You, be, you need to be focusing on success stories and not trying to be all things to all people. You need to consider cutting back on sports. You need to consider consolidating. Eight years ago, they said that. And so the universities had eight years to be thinking about this. Uh, we get to finally the time where we need to implement. And now we got a board of regents who are saying, "Ah, oh, let's give us some more time." There is no more time. We are out of time. You are going to be cut. You need to face up to it. 
and we need to get on with it as opposed to dragging our feet and, and making, frankly, the university's situation even worse because now we've got we, – we're, we're not even started the 60-day clock yet. We've got to wait another 15 days to start the 60-day clock uh, and, and get in a situation. We've got a burn – that uh, of, of current spending levels that's going to go on for that two week period uh, before we can get to it. So it's we, we've got a state that's gone into denial about some of this stuff, um, and and we need to get over that denial fairly quickly and get on with remaking the state uh, in a way that that the funding levels that the governor's approved uh, 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 create for us. One of the things that you highlighted in a post on the Fisher Report I thought that was interesting was this discussion of private funding sources. Many universities fund a, a large chunk of their university through alumni giving and other uh, and other self-raising, you know, uh, uh, you know, raising of, of uh, self-supporting funds from outside sources. And even in twenty, uh, even in twenty eleven. Uh, they were saying that, that the you know the giving rates for alumni was between one and six percent. Today it's like at three percent, and uh, and and I think the quote at the end of this whole thing, the money quote was, "There is simply not a culture of private giving in Alaska. This has been accentuated by underdeveloped fundraising organizations and the failure to make fundraising a priority." Quote: We've always depended upon Ted Stevens and the oil companies to take care of us pithily observed an alumnus, clearly this must change, unquote. And, and I think this has been the problem. Uncle Sugar, in the form of Ted Stevens, oil company, state spending, has always been there. They've never had to look outside themselves like other regular university systems have to raise their own funds. They've always had the state piggy bank there at their beck and call. Yeah, I've been I've been active in universities uh, that that – have raised a significant amount of private funds, and and part of the challenge always is if you've got uh, if you've got a state government that is funding the university at high levels, the private side donors say, well, why the heck do I need to contribute? Uh, because you've always you've got state funding uh, that that's that's supporting you. Eleven year eight years ago in the 2011 report, the university got put on notice. Not only that quote, but there are other quotes that talk about the fact that the university is so dependent on state government. So dependent on uh, uh, on on oil revenues, in, indirectly on oil revenues, uh, to to keep its fund to keep its funding up. Uh, the 2011 report said that's going to change, um, and and so you need to get ready for it. Uh, production's going at that time. Production was going down. They they didn't forecast the 2014 price drop, but the 2014 price drop has certainly added to it. So by 2014, you had the 2011 report, and you knew. That this situation was going on, the state just went into, or the, the 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 university just went into denial and said, "Well, you know, we're, we're so important. We tell ourselves in our echo chamber, we're so important. We'll never get cut." Um, and so they didn't ramp up. They they weren't they weren't in a position to ramp up private fundraising. They didn't have a storyline that we're that we're making ourselves. We need to make ourselves more independent. Uh, state funding is going to be cut. They just kept assuming that state funding was always going to be there and, and didn't make the changes on the private side. It's catching up with them. And now, you know, now essentially the claim is, well, we didn't do all this stuff, and, and we're going to be in a world of hurt by having to make these changes all at once. You need to save us. And the question really is, who needs to take the, take the responsibility for the university not stepping up and get it, getting itself ready for this? Is that, is that responsibility on the university? For not heeding these warnings, warnings from 2011, or is it on the taxpayers of the state, either through PFD cuts or other revenue sources? Is it on the taxpayers of the state that we need to keep funding the university for another, you know, three, four, five? The university will, will, will rope a dope it and take it out as long as they can for a number of three, five, seven, ten years. Uh, so the university really doesn't have to feel all this pain at once. To me, the university's been on notice. To me. There's a pathway of getting spending down. There's a pathway of remaking the university, bringing it down to a single institution, uh, bringing the programs down to those that it excels at, um, and, 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 and going forward with, it, with that new structure. To me, we need to get on with it. And, and to the governor, we need to get on with it. And to the 16, the 24, whatever number of legislators it was that, that essentially voted to up, uphold the vetoes, we need to get on with it. The university needs to face reality Look back to the 2011 report. Said, "Oh shoot, we should have been doing this, but now that we have to, we're going to do it, um, and and make the changes that they need to make." 
Brad Keithley's been our guest, Alaska's for a sustainable budget. Brad, let's wrap up. What can people do, in your opinion? What do we need to do? Because, again, some of us are just mad as hell, and we've been mad for a long time, but it seems like we're getting exactly nowhere. So what do we need to do to try and help this situation? Well, we are getting somewhere. We have the governor's vetoes, uh, and we have uh, and, and we have those vetoes upheld by the legislature. We are getting somewhere, and the reason we're getting somewhere is people are telling their legislators – in their districts, uh, that they've got their back, and and that they 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 believe in what those what the governor's done. They believe the vetoes need to be upheld, uh, and we need to keep going down this keep going down this road. People need to keep telling their legislators that they've got their back. They need to keep in their in the in the districts where these legislators come from. Their constituents need to keep telling them that they're going down the right road. Um, and, and, and keep supporting the legislators in supporting the governor. In, in, in terms of the governor, the governor needs to stay at what he's doing. He needs to keep, those, keep these vetoes in place. He needs to keep people's feet to the fire. He needs to keep the university's feet to the fire. And we don't, and we, and we don't compromise on the PFD until we get a total fiscal package or else we're just putting the PFD at even greater risk going forward. So we, need, we just need to keep – we are making progress. We need to stay on the road. And, and constituents need to be telling their legislators they're doing the right thing. They've got their back. Don't worry about your district. You're going down the right. You're going down the right direction. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. You can find him on Facebook. We've got links up on our Facebook page right now uh, in the chat room for the videos. If you want to go check it out, uh, we've got the links up there. Brad, thanks so much for uh, coming in and joining us. As always, we appreciate you being part of the program. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.